Okay, so this is day two on, or not day two, session two on the, the relearning of Tehillim 27, okay? And since we have two new people here uh, who missed the first year, I'm gonna depend on you to ask for clarification if you need clarification, okay? We're gonna do a review of what we did last time. The review is gonna be rather fast, um, and, uh, and then we're gonna try to, to figure this out, okay? So let's, uh, I'm, I'm actually gonna preface this by uh, um, uh, saying two things that I did not say last time. Was it two things or one thing? Um, I think one thing. Okay, so the approach we're using is we're using the commentary of Rabbi Elia Dinola, who is the Sforno's Talmud, okay? And what we did is we read the whole commentary last time. For the sake of clarity, uh, about a half an hour ago, 45 minutes ago, I just translated the whole thing. So I did it rather hastily. <laughs> that way I feel like we could look at it in English. Oh, I know the two notes I was going to say. Okay, note number one is, and I didn't say this last time, I don't think. We forget, or I forgot, <laughs> that these are his personal notes on the Swornos Shear, which might be why certain things grammatically don't make sense or are repetitious. Last time, uh, I don't know if it was evident, but I was struggling with a lot of the repetitious phrasing at the end. And I think it might just be because these are just the published notes, okay? So that's just one thing to keep in mind. So not that we shouldn't be medactic on uh, on like what we read uh, or medayic and what he's doing, but like, I feel like it is different when you're learning someone's unpublished notes versus when you're learning something that was written up. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, um, because I just translated this a little while ago, the version of the English translation of the Tehillim that I gave you is from last year, okay? And I updated the one on the screen in line with the Elia Danola translation of the Peric, okay? So like, you know, if it's gonna confuse you to look at the English here, then don't look at the English here, but I figured I'd give you the sheet anyway for the Hebrew. Okay, so let's reread it, re -read it again. Again, this is our, our, our we're going to review. So stop me if you need uh, uh, clarification. Um, and uh, I'm going to read the uh, Hebrew and the English because I feel like uh, we we have to get like get into this. Okay. So Ladavi by David Hashem Ori Vishi Mimi Irad Mimi Ira Hashem Maos Chaya Mimi Efchad. So of David Hashem is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Hashem is the strength of my life. Ikrovelai Mereim Leachol Espasari. When evildoers approach me to eat my flesh or to consume my flesh, sarai uh, my uh, torment, my my tormentors and those who are enemies to me, hema um, uh, they stumble and fall. Im tachane alai machane. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. If a camp is marshaled against me, lo um, yiralibi, my heart will not fear. Im takum alai milchama bzozani boteach. If uh, uh, sorry, yeah, if a war will rise against me, in this I trust, and we learned last time that the in this I trust is a colon, okay? Colon, so what is he trusting in? One thing I ask for from Hashem, this one thing I, I seek, to sit in the house of Hashem for all the days of my life, to gaze upon the pleasantness of Hashem and to uh, seek after his sanctuary. Ki yitzpreni besuko, uh, when, for he will hide me in his shelter, uh, Ra'a, on a day of evil, Yastirini Biseser Ohalo, he conceals me in the recess of his tent, um, uh, Batsur Yurum, uh, he will lift me up on a rock, uh, Ata, and now, Yarum Roshi Al Oivai, uh, he will raise up my head over my surrounding enemies, Oivai Sivibosai, the Ezbachab Oholo Zivre Sura, Ashir Vazamar Ladashem, um, I will sacrifice amid joyous cries. I will sing and make music to Hashem. Okay, so we identified the pivot point, uh, the point at which there's a change in tone or theme at Pasuk 7, and Rav Eliab Danola did the same. So that's why it's in blue. Okay, so then he says, Shema Hashem Koli Ekra Vachanini Vachanini. Hear Hashem, my voice, when I call. Be gracious unto me and answer me. Lacha, oh, this is the, so this is the difficult puzzle to translate. It was difficult originally. It was difficult when we learned it last year, and I can't figure out how the uh, Eliab Danola is learning it. So approach this with, with a certain like uh, flexibility here, okay? Because all the pronouns are, are mixed up, are, 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 are ambiguous. Lecha amar libi bakshu fanai es panacha ar Hashem avakesh. So I just kind of committed in the translation here. To you, capital Y, to Hashem, my heart said, seek out my presence, my face. Your face, Hashem, I seek. Okay. Um, I have no idea if that's correct. Al taster panacha mimeni. Do not hide your face from me. Al tat be'af abdacha. Do not turn away in wrath your servant. As Rasi ha'isa, you were my help. Al ti tesheni ve'al ta'azvini el hekei yishi. Do not forsake me and do not abandon me, God of my salvation. 
For my father and mother abandoned me, and Hashem will gather me in. Now, this was another Elia, Elia Danola um, uh, translation, Chiddush uh, here. Uh, Teach me, Hashem, your path and guide me on the level path for the sake of my Shorarai confident adversaries. Okay, I think that would be the best translation here. Uh, and then he says, I'll teach in any benefit Sarai, Kamuvi Ede Sheker Vive Hamas. Don't give me over to the will of my tormentors when false witnesses rise up against me who breathe violence. Lule Hemanti Liros Patub Adashem Eretz Chaim. Were it, if not for the fact that I believe to see the goodness of Hashem in the land of, of, uh, of life or the land of living, Kaveh Al Hashem Chazak Viamet Libecha Bakveh Al Hashem. Hope to Hashem, strengthen and embolden your heart. Hope to Hashem. Okay, so that's the translation. Okay, quick review of all of our questions. Okay, again, this is this is. I want to get the reviews as uh, quickly as possible so that we can uh, dive into the analysis because I really don't. I, I really do want to finish it at this time and not uh, leave it over. Okay, so our questions were: What is the one thing he's asking for? Is it really one thing, or is it many things? As he says in Sukkim nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Okay, two: Who are the evildoers who approach him to consume his flesh? Three: This feels schizophrenic or desperate or anxious. He switches between confidence and Hashem's salvation in the first half, and then fear of abandonment and uncertainty in the second half. For what kind of assistance is he asking for? Is he just asking for instruction, like in the Acha Sha'alti, or when he says, Horini Hashem Darkecha, teach me your way? Or is he asking for protection from his enemy, took him five and six and 12? Um, in Pasuk 3, uh, 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 I'm trusting in this. What is he trusting in? In Pasuk 9, uh, when he says, don't turn away your servant in wrath, why would Hashem turned him away in wrath. It sounds like he was pretty close with Hashem in the first part. Uh, on Pasuk 9, when he says, you were my help, what is he referring to? Is there a specific instance? Does he mean in general? Also, what is his argument? On Pasuk 11, uh, what does for the sake of my confident adversaries mean? Nine, uh, why is the Minhag to say this between Rosh Chodesh Elo and Shemina Teres, which is a side question, and can we give answers that don't involve a huge stretch? Okay. And then Shira asked a question after uh, Shira last night. My question is that, I think this is an exact quote, right? My question is that in the first half of the parak, David is asking for Hashem to help him strengthen himself in Torah and Mitzvot, but for the purpose of succeeding in war. Uh, that seems kind of selfish and disingenuous, so why would Hashem answer his prayers? So that was really a question on, on the commentary. Okay. So those are the questions. Okay, did anyone see any new questions in the course of the week <laughs> that they want to add to the list, or had questions that they had uh, from uh, from days of yore? Yeah. The problem I find with saying this in shul is they always speed through it, mm -hmm. so I can never get to the end by the time. Yeah. I was just thinking about this. Um, can you scroll down to the uh, the question on nine? I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the question that was you were my help. Um, I don't know if this was asked previously, but mm -hmm. not, not only does it seem like he's referring to something, but also does that mean war and not are? Does it mean war and what? War and not are, like you are my help? Oh, war and not are. They said war. Um, <laughs> war and not are. Yes, the past tense. So is, is that meaning to say that like currently Hashem is not his well, help? Well, it's not denying that Hashem is his help, but it is leaving open the possibility that he will not be his help, <laughs> right? You were my help, and therefore I'm asking you to be my help now. Yeah, is yeah. Um, so when David says in Pasuk 12, don't give me over to the soul of my tormentors. Yeah. So is that in terms of him, him, um, does he not want his tormentors to succeed? Is that what he's asking for? Does he not want him to lose? Is he asking for him to like not allow him to lose hope or something? Yeah. So I, um, I translated this, uh, I think when we did it last year, then, uh, Nefesh was explained by some people to mean Ratzon. Uh, and so I translated it that way here. I think he's saying, don't let my tormentors get what they want, which is to win. But what, what does that have to do with giving him over to the tormentors? Meaning they want to defeat me. So if you, if you let me be taken by them, then they're, they're getting what they okay. want. Yeah. Yes. This is going to be too nitpicky. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting in, in Yod Aleph, he says, Yeah. Why don't you say, Why don't you say, that, that, that path? Uh, you mean like Darkecha? Yeah. Uh, is that just like poetic? Okay, right. So I, I think we, we should answer, uh, we should try to figure out why he is emphasizing the straightness or the levelness of the yeah. path. And I think Rabbi Elia answers that. Okay, okay but that, so I, I don't think it's too nitpicky. Okay. It's too nitpicky for our big idea. Sure. Question, but not, not for our small ideas. Okay, so since we're gonna to try to like um, get this tonight, uh, in our four questions that we try to answer until him, we are gonna focus on 
questions one and four, okay? What is this parak saying as a whole? Okay, what's the theme or the subject and what's the main idea or message? And then what of it? Okay, like, so what? What's the purpose of it? Okay, and I think what we're going to do, rather than reading the entire Rebellia de Nola and then analyzing it like we did last time, let's go bit by bit. Okay, and I think we're even going to go, uh, we're going to go broader than bit by bit. Since he summarizes the themes in the beginning, let's read his summary of the themes and then just try to define the ideas solely based on his summary and then go into the details. Okay, that way we'll at least be guaranteed to walk away with one idea. Okay, so here's what he says. I'll just leave the Hebrew and the English up here. So the David Hashem Orivishi, Amar HaGaon. So the Gaon, Sforno said, that's his in his notes. Um, uh, I don't know if when you're taking notes for like Rupes Akshir or whatever, you write Amar HaGaon, but it's a nice uh, covered harav actually, you know, I like to, to say that. Sham Mizmor Hazeh Soviv Al Shnei Devarim. This song revolves around two themes. Echad, the first, Shad Hashem Yisparach Yosif Lo Omit Lanatseach Oivav Hanulchami Mito, that God will grant him strength, grant David strength to defeat his enemies who go to war with him. Lefisha Tachlis Kol Milchamosav Inam Kiim Laharchiv Lo, Latachlis His Asko Bator of a Mitzvah. So the only, the ultimate purpose of all of his wars is only to provide freedom. Really, literally, Laharchiv is to provide expansiveness, but it means like um, space, I guess to be involved in Torah and, and mitzvah, okay? I'm going to read the whole thing. I'm calling you after that. Vasheni, Hashem yishmerehu mi yitzro ha mizgabra la b'choyom, that um, Hashem should protect him from his yitzer, from his inclination, that threatens to overtake him every day. Ka'am Ramzal, like Chazal say, and I think I copied and pasted the Gemara down there that we did last time. Um, the Gemara, the full Gemara says, Amar Rabbi Yitzchak Yitzrosh Adam Yisgabra Allah B'chol Yom, Man's inclination threatens to overpower him every day. Shnemar, as it says, rock, rock, kol hayom. It says, only evil all day. Amar Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, Yitzrosh Adam Yisgabra Allah B'chol Yom, umavakish la miso. Man's Yitzr threatens to overtake him every day and wants to kill him. Shnemar, as it says, in Tehillim, Sofa Rasha Latati umavakish la um, miso. The Russia gazes upon the tzaddik and wants to kill him. And were it not for the fact that God helps him, then uh, then man will not be able to defeat his yetzer. Shnei as it says in the next pasuk, God does not abandon him into his hand, and does not uh, vilify him in his judgment. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the Gemara that the Rebellia is quoting. And then he says, oops, he says, Right, so Hashem should protect him from his yetzer that threatens to overtake him, but, but a Karsh Baruch saves him from his hand, as it is written, the wicked one looks at the righteous one and seeks to kill him, but Hashem will not abandon him in his hand. Uh, why does God save him? So that he is able to be involved in his Torah and to keep his mitzvahs. So those are the two themes. Our goal right now, before we get into the details, is to try to define the unity between the two themes and ex and justify the pivot, right? That's what we're always trying to do here when we find a pivot point in Tillam. We're trying to understand each side and then understand what unifies them and what, like, the mental, emotional shift that we experience when we read it, what is that supposed to do for us? Okay, yeah, fine. Yeah, it seems like his first uh, theme yeah. answers Shira's question of how it's not... Um... Like it seems, um, uh, I forgot the word, disingenuous. Yeah. Because is he saying that the whole purpose for his war is just to provide him to be involved in Torah against us? So therefore, I mean, even though even though he's talking about like help me win my wars, according to Rebellia, yeah, it's an order that he can serve God. Okay, maybe I misunderstood Shira's question. <laughs> Oh, no, I, I just projected my own question onto the question. <laughs> yeah, okay, right, right. In other words, right, that that uh, the premise of the question is uh, is wrong, right? That that's that, a selfish uh, reason. No, I think the premise is backwards, right? That um, that he's asking for help in succeeding in war so that he can be involved in Torah and mitzvahs, not help him strengthen himself in Torah and mitzvahs for the purpose of succeeding oh, in war, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I just copied and pasted the question and didn't think about it until yeah. just now. Yeah, yeah. So Shira, you'll let uh, you either type it in the chat and let us know, or you'll text Chaim and we'll have a discussion after Shir if you, if you don't want to voice your uh, your opinion now. Yeah, Isaiah? Um, so I have an idea. Yeah. Um, the unified. Theme. Good. So I think it's interesting that from the perspective of a person's soul, yeah. then these two things are really the same thing. Um, that the, the war that the enemies, that the real enemies are 
The physical enemies. Physical, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the, the I was going to ask which real enemies, yeah. The other humans are bringing up against you. Yeah. Um, and the war that the Yajahara, in this human's perspective, is bringing against you are both things that like distract a person from their ability to, I guess, just focus on a shaman, his like kakma. Right. Um, so David is really saying that he really wants the same thing to come in like two ways. He wants he wants to be able to focus on the sham. Um, so he wants help really in like both of those fields because he wants the same goal. He just wants one overall goal. Okay. Right. Okay. So I understand the unity of the of the two, right? So Isaiah is saying that that it really is asking for the same thing. It's just on the external battlefront and the internal battlefront. Uh, that that the, the there are external threats to your ability to be involved in Torah and Mitzvahs, and then there are internal threats. Okay. So I, I understand that unity. I guess my question is, does that justify the pivot? And my answer right now is no. And I'll tell you why. Because to me, I don't think that explains the tone. Yeah, I agree. I was thinking like the second half of them or well, they should have the same tone. I don't know which right. one is more justified. Yeah, in other words, they, I, it would, it, it would it, uh, if the tone were consistent, that it was confidence that God will help him defeat his enemies and confidence that God will help him defeat his nature, I'd be good. Right. Or if it was uncertainty about defeating his enemies and uncertainty right. about his nature, I'd be good. But I will yeah. say like, I don't think you can say that what I'm saying is like not true. No, it is true. And it's part of what he's saying here. Right. I don't, there's probably more. There's more. Yeah, there's more to it. I think it's a, a good foundation for uh, for the pivot, um, and it is the unity. You are answering the unity. But why? Why is that a good pivot? Because it? it doesn't justify the emotional impact of the pivot, which is that in one through seven, David is chugging along, saying that God is going to save him and protect him, and then suddenly he's cowering in fear and saying, "Don't turn me away in wrath. Don't abandon me." So Isaiah's explanation about the two battlefronts doesn't explain why he's so confident in the first half and so uncertain in the second half. That's what I mean by like justifying the pit. We have to explain why, like, you know, uh, why David changes in tone or what we're supposed to get out of the change in tone. Yeah, Chaim? Yeah, I'm so, I don't really want to take a stance yet on like what the help of God is. I mean, like, in sure. tomorrow, um, I'm kind of okay saying like last time that maybe it's like, I'm not sure. Okay. I'll leave that alone for now. But that might help premise this next point, yeah. Um, which is that to me at least, it seems like internal battles are are like almost inherently more difficult. Because yeah, it requires like like analyzing yourself. Yeah, and then learning more about yourself, and then learning how to like combat yourself. Right. Uh, or at least a part of a, a part of yourself. Yeah, you know what um, they say is your own worst enemy. Yeah. You. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I feel like I feel like that might have something to do with it. Meaning like. I get it. Like it, armies are armies are scary, but like dealing with your it's, it's almost like it, it's almost like dealing with internal struggles is like a prerequisite for dealing with external struggles. Okay. So oh, like yeah. really? Mm -hmm. Not a prerequisite. Uh, keep going. Meaning like <laughs> if someone's not internally consistent, then they're not gonna be able to like go out and like you know like Jordan Peterson says, clean your room before you try to change the world. Uh, <laughs> you know something yeah. along those lines. Uh, I don't know, I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There, but uh, I don't know, that's just a thought. Okay. Um, the, like, the, I guess my, 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 my main piece that I have yeah. is I feel like it's a more daunting and challenging task to fight the internal battle. Right. And that requires more like almost like reliance and just like submission to God. And okay. Like, I just need to like. Okay. So yeah. this is in the realm of answering the pivot, right? Which is that it is explaining why there's more desperation in the second half because it's a more difficult battle. Um, I don't know. If it, yeah, no, I, I, and I, I realize you're not trying to talk the whole thing, but I, I think that is a is a close step. You want to respond to what he's kind of saying? Yeah. Okay, and then it's we'll go to tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, I think it's the other way around. Um, <laughs> okay. Is, is that really maybe what David is saying? Is that he, in, like, when it comes down to like his soul's, you know, how much he's able to take in reality and like his, you know, position in the world. The second half is what really matters. Like he has to work on himself before he dies. Yeah. If he doesn't get to do that, then he's just not going to be what he is if he does if he if he did it. But like you can't focus on that internal battle when people are battling against <laughs> right. you. So right. he's hoping and you know confident that Hashem will allow him to be able to like partake in like the real battle. Maybe that's what I'm saying. It's like the second okay. battle, more real than the first. Battle. Okay, so I, I agree with what you're saying as well, which is that that if you have enough well, okay, I mean it's clearly two way street, but like the the um the premise of the brothers on the clothes on the Torah is that um 
the more external things you have to contend with, then the more distractions it will be from your internal stuff. Um, and the internal stuff is the main thing. Um, I see that as well. Okay, Tamar and then Ayala and then Ariel. Yeah. Um, I, I have this feeling like maybe I said something like this last time, but I'm, spot. I'm not sure, so. I, I'm, I'm, I'm right with you. I, I, I've yeah. got some of those things, yeah. All right, okay. So anyway, um, I was wondering if maybe um, these are the appropriate attitudes to have for each of these struggles. Okay. So not about what he actually, like not even just, not a response to what he feels, but a, a demonstration of the correct attitude. That maybe when you have physical enemies, you should not be afraid of them for themselves. Yeah. Because you know? Hashem can overpower them. And it's, like Hashem is the one who's in control. But when it comes to your internal struggles, you have to be very like wary. Okay. Interesting. Okay. I 1.5 agree with that. <laughs> I know that doesn't make any sense. I, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I agree with, uh, I agree with the first um, statement in half and the second statement in full. Okay. I don't know if that's 1.5. I'll explain what I mean. I, I want to hear everyone else out first. Five, 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 yeah, five, five. yeah, I guess that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was mean there was two statements, but whatever. Yeah. Okay, Ayala. Okay, so I think mine may be a little bit similar to tomorrow's, but I was thinking that maybe these are uh -oh. two ways that I, know, I, I guess, guess you can relate to the Hashkaha. Can you hear me? Um, Say it again. Okay. Oh, no, it says my internet connection is on. Yeah, 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 I think that's what's happening. Okay. The first half, I think, is... Do you hear me now? Uh, I, yeah, the, I, you heard the first half. I wasn't sure if you stopped yeah. your internet paused. <laughs> okay, fine. So pretty much what I was saying is that the first half, I think, maybe can be relating to the Hashgacha in a way of, like, we Hashem tells us how hashgacha works so we could kind of like tap into that and based off of that we know that if you set your goal as a diyas hashem then hashem will like help you achieve that goal yeah and that's like one way that we know about hashgacha but then a second thing about hashgacha if you relate it to it from a different perspective like oh, just hashem tells us that he has hashgacha but also yeah. we are not deserving of hashgacha in any way yeah and like, who are we to have Hashgacha? There's no guarantee. Like, we have to beg Hashem for Hashgacha, kind of. And from that perspective, even, like, the fact that we have free will and we could think and we can know God is not yeah. a given. And from that perspective, we have to, like, beg Hashem. So it's kind of, like, two two standpoints. Okay. All right. So let, let, me, let me just restate that. I really like this idea. It's different than I was going to say. But um, but uh, so Ayala is primarily answering the question of justifying the certainty and the uncertainty. So from the perspective of the Hashgacha itself, then there is absolute certainty. In other words, if you are doing what David says, if you follow the uh, the recipe, which is Akash Adi Hashem Akesh, and you only want to, uh, you know what I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> that, that, was, uh, that was accidental, but um, I'll say it anyway, right? Um, the uh, Quoting the uh, the famous Rafi Kalantik Mashal of <laughs> uh God designed the world in such a way where if you mix uh, flour and eggs and oil and sugar and stuff, and you put it into a bowl and, uh, thingy and you put it into the, the right degree uh, oven, temperature oven, then a cake will pop out, <laughs> right? So the way that the laws of nature is that God designed the, uh, God designed the laws of nature in such that if you, if you engage the world in the right way, then cakes pop out. And he designed the laws of Hoshgacha in the way where if you engage in those laws in the right way, then defeating your enemies pops out. Cakes. Yeah, metaphysical <laughs> cakes, right? So, so that's from the perspective of Hoshgacha, and it's absolutely certain, okay? But the second half is speaking from the perspective of Bahira and deservingness of Hoshgacha, and the fact that you could veer off and not live up to that. And from there, you are totally like, in, at, not totally, sorry. You are at Hashem's mercy to help you uh, because it's a huge struggle that is ultimately going to depend on de be dependent on your uh, your choices. So it's it's a uh, it's going back and forth between the uh, perspective of the hashkaf and the perspective of man. Yeah, Chaim. Uh, I'm a little confused though because isn't Hashem helping you the hashkaf? Yes. So so the being at the mercy of Hashem helping you in the second half is being at the mercy of. Well, I, the way Ayala said it is that you don't deserve the hashkaf. Right, like you know, who are you to say that you deserve this help? And that that is like a uh, a, a, a perspective of humility and a recognition of like how far away you are from that stuff, from deserving it. Do you know what I'm saying? Maybe. No, I got to okay. Yeah, Isaiah. No, no. Oh, okay. 
Okay, I like that approach, Ayala. I think my one question on it is, is there something about, I see the idea of talking about the two angles of relating to the Hashkafa. Is there one, is there a reason, I guess, why, I, I think there's an answer to this, by the way, I'm, I'm not, wait, <laughs> is there a reason why the confidence is attached, the confident Hashkafa down approach is attached to the external enemies and the like uncertainty approach is attached to the battle with the Yetzer? Um, I think I would say because like that's the Hashgacha that Hashem told us how it works. Ah. But I feel like kind of the fact that we have free will, like mm -hmm. that's like kind of a question. And okay, yeah. I see. So all the realm of our uncertainty is in the realm of of um, the internal. Okay, I like that answer. That's a good answer. Okay, good. All right, I already you have an answer. Uh, yeah, it's actually similar to the other. Okay, I think I think it's a little different. Yeah, you know, I think the the first half of the the first half of the Tehillim, um, you know, that's going on the, the external enemies, I think a lot of it has to do with, like, you know, I think the uh, the certainty has to do with primarily on them. Yeah. Meaning, like, if they're going to act evil and if they're going to, you know, act the way they are and we're righteous, then, like, yeah, it's, you know, it's like, it's like you know, what she was saying, you know, there's a certain natural consequence on that and, you know, there's nothing we have to do because there's more certainty there versus, um, I think this is where we differ. Whereas when it comes to ourselves, you know, I think it more has to do with like, because we're, we're always like, you know, like this. Do you mean like fluctuating? Yeah, like okay, fluctuating. yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was going like this. I didn't know what he meant, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're yeah. always fluctuating, yeah. like good, bad, this, yeah. that, and we're, we're always, you know, at odds with ourselves in terms of, you know. No, y'all, I'm very. Yeah, we're, we're, we're better. Yeah. So, so that being said, like, you know, there's more, there is more of a desperation in, in helping us out in, 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 that, in that respect. Right. So it's not like, you know, so so we're almost like, like at the mercy of ourselves to yes, okay, you know? right. So there, I think that's there, where we're. Yes. I don't know if I'm focused on the bakira so much. I'm focused more on the challenge in you know in, in an internal struggle. Okay, yeah. Isn't that, isn't that just a challenge of being a bakira being? <laughs> just <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah. No, no, but I, I do think it is. It's related to, but I think it is slightly different than Ayala's. This is what I was going to say. So let me say it in my words, and then sure. we'll see where. And this is also, um, I, I also take slight issue with what Tamara said. And to, not issue, but I, I have my own take on it. So let me say it the way I do it, and then we'll put it together and see if it makes sense. Okay, see what makes sense. So I'm going to lead with the Rambam here, okay, in uh, Tshuva strong, strong. about Bechira. What? Strong lead, strong lead. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bold move. <laughs> see if it pays off. Okay, so we're going to start with the... Um, uh, I just want to read the first couple of halachos and the parak uh, Hamishi of Tshuva. So Rashus kol admin sin alav. Choice or control is given to every person. Im rata lahatos atmo lederek tova v'lios tzadik harishus biada. If a person wants to incline himself to the good path and to become a tzadik, he has the uh, choice. Of im rata lahatos atmo lederek rahav v'lios rasha harishus biada. And if he wants to incline himself to the bad path and to be a rasha harishus biada, he has the choice. Hush gaz vomer a batora. This is what's written in the Torah. In Breshis 3.22, Hain, so he's going he's gonna to misread the Pasuk, okay? I mean, he's going to read it like the Uncle Lewis reads it, not like the, the, the Tamim. Hain ha'adam haya ke'achad mimenu ladas tovara. So he learns it as Hain ha'adam haya ke'achad, comma, or dash, mimenu ladas tovara, okay? Klomar, Hain min zesh adam, behold, the species of man, haya echad ba'olam, is unique in the world. Ve'in lo min sheni lo domilo and there's no second species comparable to him in this regard. That he, by himself, with his mind and his thoughts, knows the good and the bad, and does whatever he wants. And there's nothing that can prevent him from doing the good or the bad. And because that's the case, Pen Yishlah Yado, then Hashem says, lest he stretch forth his hand and take from the Etzachim and live uh, forever. Okay, so what, what, what's the Raya from Pen Yishlah Yado? What, what point is he making there? God's talking, you know, like an uncertain. Yeah, God is saying, what if he does this? Well, what do you mean, what if he does this? God can control him. No, God does not control him, right? So that's why God is, is saying, lest he, uh, he, he do this. Okay. Don't let this thought pass into your mind, which is said by the uh, the idiots of the world and the majority of the undeveloped Jews. 
Russia. The God decrees for man's birth that he'll be a tzaddik or a Russia. Ina again, that's not true. Adam the Adam tzaddik or Russia ki Each and every person is fit to be a tzaddik like Moshe Rabbeinu or a Russia like Yeravam. Or wise or foolish or merciful or cruel or stingy or spendthrifty and all the other uh, deos. The in lo me. Okay, now this is what I wanted to get to. The in, I mean, that was all important, but the in lo mishi yechpehu vlo gozer la vlo mishi moshcha la mishi neatrachim. No one coerces you, no one decrees upon you, and no one draws you to one of two paths. Elohu me atmu umidato note le eze derech shirte. He by himself, with his mind, inclines to whichever path he wants. Now he's going to quote three psukim in Eicha. Okay, I want to read the psukim. Um, in order first, okay. Mi p el yon lo se tse hara The bad things and the good things do not come from the mouth of the of the Most High. Okay, which sounds heretical, right? Because we we hold that God is yoter or ubore ra that God creates good and bad. So what does it mean that good and bad doesn't come from God? Okay. Then he says, Ma yis onin adam chai giver achataav. What can a living man bemoan? Each man over his sins. Let us investigate our actions and uh, search out our actions and investigate and return to Hashem. Okay, so listen how the Ram Darshan's it. From the mouth of the on high does not come the bads and the goods. God does not decree upon man to be good or bad. So it's not talking about the goods and bads externally. It's saying God does not make you good or bad. Okay, you make you good or bad. The Cayman Shikane who, and since that's the case, Nimsa Zeha Chote, who hifsid atmo. Turns out, consequently, this sinner causes his own harm. He's harming himself. Therefore, it is fit for him to cry and lament over what he did to himself and the badness that he did to his own soul, okay? So all the bad that you experience is from you, okay? Is, is it not, I mean, not directly necessary, but it's as a result of your choices. That's why it says, what can a person complain about? Only one thing, each person over his own sins. And then he goes back and says, since our, uh, we have free choice, and we do all bad things from our own mind, it's befitting for us to return into Shuva and to ban in our wickedness. The choice is ours now. This is what is written afterwards. Let's uh, search out our ways and investigate and return to Hashem. Okay, so that's that's the principle of Bukhira. Okay, so what does this have to do with our parak? Okay, so I, I, I think I primarily agree with Ariel, but with smatterings of uh, what Ayal and Tamar were saying, which is like this. We know, like Ayala said, <laughs> that um, that uh, the laws of the Hashgacha state that if you follow Hashem's will, then he will help you to defeat all your enemies and um, and you'll have peace and tranquility. OK, that's how David could be so confident in the first half by saying that as long as he focuses on uh, on on making that his priority. And that's the only reason he's involved in wars. OK, not all the reasons that other kings are involved in wars, like personal glory or like national glory or riches or whatever. Yeah. So then he's in line with God's value system. And this is how the Hashgacha works and God will help him. OK, however, the big uncertainty is the one thing that God doesn't control, which is internal, the internal world, right? That's a Kobi Dishmaim Chutz Mir Shemaim. That God has no control over. The only one who has control over it is you. Okay. So that's where all the uncertainty comes in. However, even there, God provides us with help. And we need God's help in order to overcome the Yitzhahara. That's the Gemara that Rabbi Ilya quoted, that uh, each and every day the Yitzhahara threatens to overtake us. And uh, if it weren't for the fact that God helped us, then, it would, then, uh, then we'd be defeated. So that's why we need to ask God to assist us in, um, in living in line with his, uh, his values. So in other words, I, I, I think it does work out the way Ayala was saying it, which is that the first half is articulating this grand vision of all man has to do is follow the Torah and, uh, and, and have his values aligned, and God will help him. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of your own, uh, your own decision making, and there you need God to help you. And the one thing I slightly take issue with, with Tamar, that Tamar said, and I don't know how Dafka you're being Tamar about this, but Tamar said that we know that God has the ability to defeat the enemies. 
Now that's true, but I don't think that's essentially what it means when it says God helping David win the wars. Okay. I think what it's essentially meaning is that, you know, <laughs> David Hamelch can choose what to do when the enemies are overtaking him. I think we had this in another parak. Uh, when it was describing that when the enemies have set up a camp against him, maybe it was this parable with the Radah, you know, that like, that even when the enemies are on your doorstep, or when your, your enemies have defeated you, that itself is not an excuse for saying, sorry, God, I can't keep throwing mitos. Like you can always, you know, I, I, I was talking about this this morning with somebody that if you ask Rabbi Akiva, you know, is it easier to think about Torah when your flesh is not being combed? He would say yes. Right. And if you ask him, do you want God to make it so that people don't comb your flesh? He would say yes. But you see that Rabbi Akiva did not allow having his flesh combed to death interfere with his ability to be Osik and Torah and Mitzvos. And in fact, he was able to reach a higher level through that being put in that situation than he would otherwise, because that's when he reached the, the peak of, uh, of, of Avas Hashem. You know, so I think. I think, so again, not disagreeing with what Tamara said, but I think the emphasis on the uh, Hashem being his light and his, his salvation, to, for me, is uh, it, it's a more resonant message to say that as long as you make God your light and your salvation, and like you keep your eye on that value system, and you implement it everywhere, then your enemies can't defeat you, right? And we're not talking about the material defeat of, of enemies like, like beating you in war. We're talking about, about defeating you in the real way, which is to unseat you from this trap of Torah mitzvahs. Okay. Thoughts? I yeah, I saw you having the thought. And I saw you losing it also. Oh, no, no. That was a joke. Oh, that was a joke? Okay. That was when you were like, all man has to do is... Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, Mahashem, what does that do? Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that perspective. Okay. So if there are no immediate questions, let's play it out through the rest of Rebellia's commentary. Okay. And we have to get to that controversial end. Okay. And, and explain that. Okay. So I'm going to just read it in English because we did it all in Hebrew last time. Um, and I'm just going to focus on the parts that are important, um, not that I'm the, the, the one who's deciding that, but um, the parts that are relevant to this main idea, because our goal is to get the main idea here. Okay, so he said, so I think this part supports what I was saying. He said, Hashem is my light and my salvation, therefore whom shall I, from whom shall I fear? If regimes mobilize against me to kill me, Hashem is my light and my salvation, therefore what shall I be afraid of and what can man do to me? This is stated in the manner of when I sit in darkness, Hashem is light unto me. Additionally, he said, if Hashem is the strength of my life, that at all times shall and his men encircle me, but Hashem saves me from their hand. If so, of whom shall I be afraid? So there's two ways to learn this. You could learn this and say that Hashem will physically protect him from his enemies, or you could say, no, Hashem is my light, which is he is the one who is, you know, uh, uh, you know, determining what it is that I'm able to see. And, uh, and, and like, you know, he's the perspective through which I'm seeing the world, you know, and, and uh, that is going to be the, uh, the protecting uh, of me. Okay. When evildoers approach me to eat my flesh, who seek to take my soul, likewise my tormentors and those who are enemies to me, the nations of the world, they stumble and fall, but not I, uh, as they would counsel against me. So that's just a continuation. If a camp is marshaled against me, my heart will not fear. If a war will rise against me, in this I trust, namely, that one thing I've asked from Hashem, etc., to gaze upon the pleasantness of Hashem in study and seek after a sanctuary in action. So we mentioned that last time, which is that those are the two areas of perfection. You could be similar to God. You have to be strive to be similar to God in your mind, which is aligning your mind with truth, and in your actions, which is enacting the Midas Gadosh Baruch Hu in Chesed Rachim and Mishpat and all that good stuff. Okay, for he will hide me in his shelter on the day of evil. The word shelter refers only to a cave which is concealed from the enemy, as in he conceals me in the recesses of his tent. This means in the merit of his tent, which is the tent that doesn't falter, namely the Torah, the tents of Torah. On a rock he raises me up, that he prevents me from coming into trouble and shields me like a rock that shields the one who comes to take refuge in its cleft. If we have uh, uh, time, I would really like to understand why he uses this muscle of, pr of protection of a uh, tent and the cleft of a rock. Very different mashal. I mean, tent is not the most like um, protective structure, you know, uh, cleft of the rock is. So cleft is like a, 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 um, a crack or a fissure and like an opening in the rock where you go and like enemies can't get you. Yeah. But what is being sort of secluded in like studying of Torah sort of have to do with the idea of the first half of like right. Hashem will save him from your enemies? Yeah. So I, I do think that, um, again, I, 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 I see you can read this both ways, but I, I think this supports my way, is that he's saying that the zuchus by which God saves him is the Torah. So what does that mean? Zuchus is not a magical uh, currency mana, if you will, that you can just like spend on protection, right? Protection spells. 
Um, but um, it is uh, to the extent that you are guided by Torah, then you're not going to be able to be thrown off of the path of Torah and mitzvos, no matter what happens. So it's the tent that doesn't move. In other words, like like you, you can always be in the tent of Torah. You know, yeah. Shouldn't you say something like, "I will place myself in in your"? Okay, like I will be the one right. So there. ultimately, you're right. He's the one who does it, but he's going to attribute it to Hashem, as he's going to say later on that Hashem is the one who gave the Torah, and that is how Hashem guides you, is through through giving you the Torah that you can follow. Right. Okay. All right. And now, because my sole intention is to serve Hashem, He will raise up my head around my surrounding enemies. Okay. So that whole first half is relatively easy. I think that's part we got the most. Now we get to the second half. Hear Hashem my voice when I call. Here he enters into the second section, which we mentioned, to beg before the presence of God to save him from his yetzer. Be gracious unto me and answer me. If this means to say, give me the undeserved gift, the matnas chinam, for the expression gracious in every place means an undeserved gift. So that's like what Ayala was saying. Who's to say that we deserve the hashgacha? No one. <laughs> okay. That's why we, we it's, it's chanun. Okay. That's why we say um, uh, chaneni vaneni. Okay. Um, this is the part I couldn't translate. So I'm just going to skip to where he reiterates it. When God says, seek my presence, he says this. No, even this, I don't know. Okay, I, I, I don't know my, my pronouns here. Okay, uh, uh, <laughs> this is a uh, very, very, uh, I, what? <laughs> yeah, um, I know those pronouns. I don't know, uh, <laughs> I don't know Dovey's pronouns. No, that sounds bad. Okay, um, um, I don't know which pronouns are being used in the Pasuk. Uh, so like, just listen to this. I'm just going to read it. V'amar l'cha amar libi bakshu fanai. Yirte biglalcha amar libi kishe amar atem panai bakshu. Hainu lahavi no lahaskil. Klamar kishe hu omer kel panai bakshu biglalcha amar ze. No clue what's flying. Okay, so we're going to skip that. And if you, I'll ask two things. Now it gets clear again. If you, I'll ask two things. Do not hide your face from me when the wrath of the inciter mobilizes against me. That's the Yitzhahara. And two, here's a Chiddush. Do not turn away in wrath your servant. This means to say, do not make it necessary for me to acquire the means of sustaining my temporal life, driving me away under the yoke of Derek Eretz, which is wrath. Okay, so this is, you relate to this, right? Um, so, <laughs> what, why me? <laughs> because you're always talking about work and how work is a very distracting uh, thing and uh, absorbs your energy, right? We just literally had a conversation about this right before uh, here. okay? So in other words, um, he's asking Hashem, so he's saying wrath is not wrath at being punished for Avera. So I think that's what we usually think of when we think of wrath. He's saying wrath is if you have to make a living and the, the involvement in making a living takes you away from being involved in Torah and mitzvos, then that is another use of hard temptation. How did you even working from that? So I was I was processing very different than you were. But no, no, no. This is not what I read. I was reading the first part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Derek Harris's work, right? Yeah. Don't make it necessary for me to acquire temporal life, and to throw me off or burden me, but old Derek Eretz who off. Yeah, fine. I think I was thinking last time when we said off. When, when yeah. Nine, it's very similar in some ways to the off in, in the higher as well. Uh, uh, the, right. And I mean, eventually you're going to like, get kicked out of the land, but like, you, won't, you won't get rain and, and your crops won't yield. Like, that's a Derek Harris problem. Uh, that is true, right? But I don't know if, see, there, what God is getting angry at results in having the Derek Harris problem. Here, I think he's saying that the. I think he's saying that the needing to be preoccupied with Derek Harris is the off. Hmm. Also, that's for um, for Avodah yeah, Zarah. Yeah, that's the Haron off, right? Oh. Which is uh, which it might be different. Yeah. I don't know if it's just me, but like I find it a little strange out of all the things I could have possibly mentioned, like it was, it's this. That's like I find it the opposite. Why? Why do you think that that's the? Uh... I just feel like it's just so like. The truth. It's, it's like an everyday thing. It's like yeah, I think that's exactly why he talks about it because this is something that that you uh, right? That you you have to work, right? You, you have to work to make a living, so it is a perpetual distraction. For example, just to contrast it, right? Just to compare it to Shlomo Melech, Shlomo Melech often talks initially about like being seduced by this strange woman, right? You don't have to go near strange women, but you have to work every day. Right, there's strange women there too. Okay, right. So, <laughs> so maybe that's part of the Itzahara temptation. Yeah, right. Okay. 
Um, right. So then he says, for you were my help until now. Do not forsake me and abandon me, God of my salvation, in the manner if you will not abandon him into his hand. That's referencing the Gemara. Yes. So in our idea, in this part about the, um, how people are not necessarily, like you can go either way. Yeah. Um, what does it mean that you were my help until now? Like Hashem always helped David um, with his Yitzhahara? Like I'm... Okay. This seems like a stretch. It's a good question. Um, I don't know at what point in David's life this is referring to. According to Sforno and according to Rav Elia, this is during the Shaul period. So what was David's life like right before the whole um, him becoming Malak and Shaul trying to kill him? It was like, oh yeah, he was like a shepherd. He was a shepherd, right? right? And Hashem took good care of him. Right, he had no distractions. He was able to just like ten sheep and think Torah. Right, so that, that, that's why I'd say that that he's referring to, um, which is like you know one of the things that bothered me about Sforno and his students' approach is why are we locating this at Shalom Hamelik's time? This answers that. I don't know if this is why they're doing it, but I think that's what he's referring to. Yeah. Okay. And and uh, if for details, see Talim twenty three. That is uh, uh, the the shepherd uh, pair. Okay. Okay. For my father and mother have forsaken me. He says, my father and mother, for after they do their part by contributing the material, we can add here in um, uh, in modern parlance, mm -hmm. genetic material, uh, to reproduce in kind, they forsook me. They lack, for they lack the power to perfect the component that God makes. As Ghazal said, there are three partners in man. And a Karsh Baruch who forms a form within a form and endows it with a soul, etc. That was the Gemara you quoted. And uh, Hashem will gather me in, for he is the one who completes and grants us true perfection. If so, you are our true father, as he said. Is he not your father who created you? He made you and he established you. I belong to you, save me. This, again, to me is another, this is the strongest ride for my way of, of learning the first half, which is we're not talking about Hashem's power over external matter. In fact, we're rejecting that. We're saying that your parents are the ones who are responsible for your material self. God is the one who perfects you by giving you the Torah and by giving you the Tzalem Elohim to learn the Torah with. So I think it's talking about God's influence on your Tzalem Elohim development. Yeah, Isaiah? Maybe, maybe you're answering my question, but like, why is he including the discussion of the father and mother? Because it, it, um, it doesn't seem relevant to his discuss like yeah you're right part about it, like, feel, it feels like a non sequitur yeah it feels like a non sequitur yeah yeah Chaim, you want to answer that no I have a question. okay so i would answer that by saying that um uh and maybe maybe this is a cheap move okay but um when you're talking when you invoke midas harachamim you frame you 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 use lashem b'nei adam and relate to god through the mashal of rachamim and the most common form of that that we use is avinu uh, you know, uh, uh, right. Um, so I think treating God as the, as a parent, which also conveys this true idea that God is the one who forms the real you is like a good way to like, it's a good right. way, a key way for God in this context. I guess I was wondering, is there like a Havamina that his father and mother could have done anything in like, yeah, it's a good developed. question. I was wondering about this. Uh, there's this weird thing. I'm going to segue, uh, uh, not segue. They are, they did parent him. It's not really true that all they did was. Right. Yeah. Also, not every parent parents is necessarily going to be like, in, in, like to use it, to, use, to continue the, uh, the, the, the muscle, I guess. Yeah. Like unlearned, you know? Like, right. It's like, I don't know, what if someone's father is their Rebbe? Then, right. then there are many times I'll talk about him bringing him into the next Right. Life, you know? So like, so I, I, I associate to, to give uh, to ground what you're saying in the uh, Tanakh here, Yirmiyahu 1 5, the first Nubu that Hashem gives him, he says, Hashem says, Beterm et Sarcha Babetan Yedaticha, Uterm Tete Me Racham, Hikdash Ticha, Navil Gom Nesaticha, Nesaticha, yeah, Nesaticha. So before you were formed in the womb, I knew you, and before you emerged from the womb, I sanctified you. So the question is, what does it mean God designated or sanctified him as a Navi before he emerged from the womb? You know, like that sounds like violation of what Ram said in the fifth paragraph of uh, Chuba, you know? So the answer that the Radak gives is he says, you know, parents can have an impact on your uh, moral predispositions if they're knowing with each other with Kedusha, you know, and that can set you up to like be, you know, to be on the right path to Navua, to be like predisposed to becoming a Navi, whereas someone, say you have parents who neglected you or whatever. Right. So then like that's, you're going to have a much harder time reaching Navua. Right. So, um, and, and, you know, I think we do say good stuff about Yishai, Right, that Yishai was one of the. I mean, because also he was one of the people who didn't sin. Yeah. So it seems like he's a pretty good father, you know. David Ben Yishai were always like, uh, you know, referring to him. So yeah, it is a little strange. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not sure why. Uh, I don't know what the hobby is. Okay, now let's. Oh, we're almost at the um, 
Okay, now we're gonna answer your question, the aisle. Maybe what I was thinking the Havamina may have been is like now David's saying that like ultimately maybe like I guess he's like doesn't know where to turn kind of. Yeah. And the only place he can turn is to Hashem. But maybe yeah. like the Havamina is that you would turn to your father and mother, like the other Okay, so that's good that also. Being. Right. That is good also. Right. Is that uh the, the natural thing is to turn to your parents for guidance and he's uh there, there is a measure for like that, but not exclusive to your family. It's you know, if your families don't have the right values as you versus mm -hmm. your friend, you know, it's a mistake to go to your family versus mm -hmm. your, your friend. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So just just so. going back to the end of Shemuel gathering the end, yeah. the one who completes and grants us to perfection. Yeah. How does that work with this whole framework of the Hira? <laughs> I think the next person answers okay. it. Okay, why? He says, and now teach me, Hashem, your path and guide me on a level path for the sake of my confident adversaries. So who are the confident adversaries? Rotzalem or Shri Ruyos Halev. Okay, the certainties of the heart um, uh, from the expression Sharir Vakayan. This is because the entire Torah guides man on a straight path, guiding him on a path that his Yitzhahara doesn't know, leading him straight to the good. Okay, so this answers your original question, which is why are we emphasizing the straight path? Mm -hmm. uh, because the Yitzhahara is incapable of seeing the straight path. Okay, and uh, meaning that, you know, if you left up to your own devices, you would not develop in a straightforward fashion. You would just go to whatever is like tempting you. Yeah. My original question was why your path and the straight path? Right, so this answers both. It's your path because Hashem is the one who, who gave us the Torah. And it's a straight path because it is in contrast to the crooked path of the Yitzhahara. Wouldn't God's path like automatically be straight? Yeah, but how would you know that he's emphasizing that quality? Uh -huh, okay. Right. Yeah. And then this answers the other question, which uh, that Isaiah was asking, which is um, Hashem gathers me in. How does Hashem gather me in? By teaching us Torah, by giving us Torah, teaching us Torah, giving us the telling to do this. So I, I understand what you're getting at with your question, which is, isn't the whole emphasis in the second half that it's all on you? The answer is ultimately it's all on you. But but you're appealing to God for all of the guidance that He equipped you with, um, and that is going to be how you can like utilize this correctly. Okay. So it's really the same appeal in the first half and the second half. Right. It's just that this, the first half doesn't take into account bechira and the uncertainties of you uh, failing. You know. Right. Yeah. But it should though. Shouldn't it? Well, the first half is like a uh, is expressing the lachat chila like that. Insofar as as ahash alti meisachem uza vakesh then everything's going to go smoothly. So you, you have to talk about that because otherwise you're like, you know, the whole point of the parak is not going to be mentioned. Is right? that true on both sides? I mean, uh, not, not well, but, but the, 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 the first half is, the, the scenario here is David is talking about, uh, is talking about defeating his enemies in war, right? And overcoming like the, the, the obstacles. So if you just said the second half, that's not gonna it's not gonna shed any light on this in the on the situation. Really ultimately what we want is we want to express our confidence in Hashem that he's gonna help us win our wars so that we can be involved in Torah. But aren't you only gonna be that confident if you are uh, showing to be a Hashem Yeah, and you're only gonna do that if you Right. So isn't that already then like it again, it's like it's like the same it's the, it's the same mechanism on, 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 on both sides then now. Uh, they're just, they're just like attacking two different right, things. yeah, yeah, two different Thanks. places, right? Uh, right. So, are you asking why the, the original question we asked, which is why the first one's attached to the certainty and the second one's attached to the uncertainty? Maybe, okay, you want to maybe, yeah, right. executive decision. I see your hand up, Ayala. I, I really do want to just try to round this off, and I don't want to go over time. Uh, I, don't, I, I want to end on time, and then we can always continue discussing it. Okay, so this, this was the most radical part, okay? I beseech you, Hashem, don't give me over to the will of my tormentors, which are the thoughts and fantasies of the heart, okay? So that, that is who we are talking about when we say the um, uh, nefesh sarai, the tormentors. Ki kamu vi ede sheker, when false witnesses rise up against me, namely the heart and the eyes, okay? Uh, as Chazal say, the heart and the eyes are the emissaries of sin, okay? And they're false witnesses because they lie. And those who breathe violence, which means to utter violence, telling me to, okay, this is the key part, telling me to sin because Hashem is merciful and he in his abundant mercies will forgive, saying, hope to Hashem, strengthen and embolden your heart and hope to Hashem. So that was the key chedesh. The key chedesh of the, um, the reading wise is that is the voice of the Yitzhahara. Okay. It's not 
David Melk telling you truths. It's the Yitzhar telling you falsehoods. And what is the falsehood that it's telling you? It's saying you can go on and keep on sinning because God will just forgive you. Okay. And he said, so he repeats this a couple of times because I think this is the part where it's notes. And then he, he summarizes the, the flow of the psukim. The flow of the psukim is like this. When false witnesses and those who breathe violence rise up against me and would be able to defeat me, if not for the fact that I believe to see the goodness of Hashem in the land of life. That part, he doesn't explain. We have to explain that. And what does this speaker of violence say to me? He says, hope to Hashem, etc. For even if you continue to sin in abundance, he will pardon you and heal your waywardness. Not only is the speaker lying, okay, for as it says in Bava Kama, anyone who says that a Kashbar who is lax, let his bowels become lax. But he also speaks violence, namely, uh, not in line with righteousness for God judges. So what, what I really want to understand in the remaining five minutes, if we look at the Psukim again, uh, through the lens of Rav Elia, there are three points. I think it's three points. Point number one, oh, sorry, not three points. Okay, there's more. Okay, fine. So starting with Pasuk number, not, uh, let's just go through all of them. Pasuk seven, hear Hashem my voice when I call, be gracious with me, answer me. That's him first recognizing that I need Hashem's help. Okay, Um Eight, we have no idea what he means. Nine, he's saying, don't hide your face from me. Don't turn away in wrath. means don't let me get pulled in by the pressures and yitaharas of work. Um, uh, you were my help. Don't forsake me. Don't abandon me. Hashem, God, my salvation. For my father and mother, if I forsake me, Hashem will gather me in. You're the one who perfects me by giving me 11, the Torah, which gives me a path that Yitzhar will not be able to find on its own. Don't give me over into the will of my tormentors, namely my Yetzer Hara. Sorry, uh, yeah, my Yetzer Hara. When false witnesses rise up against me, namely when my eyes and my heart see, conspire to like lead me astray, uh, then don't let them. Somehow, the fact that I believe to see the goodness of Hashem in the land of life is the antidote for that. And then they say to me, "Hope to Hashem, He'll forgive you. Just keep sinning." So we need to like unify these points at the end. That's that's the that's what I would like to do if we can. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think I can answer the thirteen. Okay. Um, so I heard it here from Rebbe. Stay close. Not no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's called um, Tefillah and Shuvah or something. Okay. Like that. And in second half of the Shuvah, he's talking about a Chazal that um, tells you that you should do Teshuvah um, when you're young. Yeah. Like you can only do Teshuvah. When- when you're, you can do two when you're older, but it's not the same as two bad you can do when you're young. Right. And why? Because when you're old, I think he was saying, like, you don't have certain, like, um, pleasures that you have when you're young. So, like, if you're giving them up when you're old, it's, you're, you're like, you're already, I don't know, you're not being led by those pleasures anymore. But anyway, I think that the point of this is that he believes in, oh, part of the cheer was that, um, you should use things like Om Haba as like a thing to get you to do Teshuva, to realize that like the end is coming and you need to remember that you're gonna die at some point and like you need to be a certain way before you die. Because when you die, like the, the level that your soul is at when you die is like right. the final point you're stuck. that your soul is gonna be at. So like he believes in the goodness of Hashem and the land of the life. Like, which is Om Haba. Which is Om Haba. Right. And he recognizes that if it weren't for the fact that he believed in that, he would definitely follow the eyes and ears. Okay, that's a good shot. He does believe. Okay, that's a good shot. I like that. Yeah, and and, and, and I'm totally acknowledging that Rib Elliot doesn't explain it, so I'm fine just getting whatever explanation we can. Yeah. Okay, that's good. I like that. Well, what's called the that? I mean, the, the, what, the, um, the eyes and the Yisrahara are... are the yeah, they're the ones who lead you astray, and they uh, they lead you astray through these lies by saying that God will just forgive you if you, uh, if you say it. Yeah. Can, can I explain uh, 13 a little differently? Sure. Land of life? Yeah. I think it's Mishle. Okay. You go on. I, I was thinking similarly. I mean, I like Isaiah's shot as well, but yeah, go ahead. Because um, I, 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 th- I think like uh, like if you, if you see the world of like, you know, great things happen when you do good things. Yeah. You know, um, I, I think the opposite of that is, you know, you know, the, the eyes and the ears are hard. They're telling you to do bad things. Right. You know, yeah. Like you don't do that because you see the positivity of what's happening in the life. Okay. Of life, yeah. Yeah. So, like, so just, just to like, explain what just, Ariel's saying is like, it. we're not for the fact that I believe that I would see good in the land of people who are alive, right? Of, of like, like Olam Hazat, you know, and you need to be able to see the good of Hashem's system in that in order to 
get away from the Itahara. I think that's a good shot as well. I had a, um, I had a, uh, a meta. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. like, I think someone told me, if you don't learn a good Gemara, and you haven't lived in all of that. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I like your other shot better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Right. So I, I really would just like to get the unity in this, but I, uh, I don't want to keep people over time. So I also don't want to, um, unless like there's some revolutionary new understanding for next time, then I don't want to do this next week. I want to try to find something else to do. Um, but let's just summarize it really quickly. The, the takeaway message, and I think the message that you should think about, <laughs> what we should really do is listen to part three of last year's year, because I think we gave, a, we gave a really good idea there. So I'll send that out again also. Um, but um, I think the, the takeaway here is that um, that if you make Pasuk Dalid into your value system of the one thing that you're intent on in all the stuff that you're doing, like let's say, again, we're not fighting wars. Let's say you're trying to get good grades in college or trying to get like money or whatever. You have to realize that those are a means to an end and this is the end. And insofar as you actually keep that, then God will help you to succeed because you're going to keep on pursuing Torah and mitzvot through those things. But there is this huge internal battleground that you are at a huge disadvantage uh, uh, at because of the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the eight day check here that are like distracting you, but you have been given all this help by God in the form of the Torah, in the form of the Tzalim Elohim, in the form of, of Hashgacha. I'm not discounting Hashgacha, you know, like other forms of Hashgacha, but that's like not as reliable as Torah, right? That Torah is the most re reliable form of Hashgacha because it's for everybody. Um, so you need to take full responsibility for that and not rationalize saying God's just going to uh, like, uh, you know, like, Forgive me if I sin. Like that's not going to get you anywhere. You're just going to get more entrenched in these these uh, these bad ways. But I, I really feel like we need to get the unity of the last half in order to really crack the pair. Okay, it was worth looking at this again. I think it's still uh, you know good to look at every year. But I, I highly recommend listening to part three of last year's uh, year, which I wanted. Now I'm going to allow myself to do it because it's not going to influence me anymore. Yeah. Right? What, what was that term that you used to connect the the first half and the second half? Pivot. The pivot. Yeah, the pivot point. Why isn't Pasuk 7 the pivot point? Well, it, it, you mean... Oh, no, no, there's another term. There was another term uh, that you used. Um, mm -hmm. Not a pivot, but... You have it in a green, <laughs> I remember. Oh, oh last year? Well, oh, yeah, the hinge. There was a hinge. The hinge. Yeah, the yeah. hinge. Why isn't the 7 the hinge? You could make an argument that 7 is the hinge. So by, uh, by saying hinge, Ariel means... Uh, so the, this is the hinge theory. There's pivot theory and the hinge theory. Hinge theory is that... Uh, there's a puzzle that could be read as the last puzzle in the first half or the first puzzle in the second half, and it serves both. The only reason I'm not doing that, well, it's two reasons. One is Rev. Elia doesn't do that. Okay. But the other reason is because the Bakashos start in seven. And like that's where he's uncertain. So I, I, I think it really fits much more with the second half than the first half. Okay. Yeah. Especially with the other one that we talked about on I guess. Yeah, Hanini. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> right. That's <laughs> essentially for the second idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah correct. Ayala. So about what we were saying about Torah, like being the kind of the way that Hashem helps us against Ari Tahara. Yeah. That sounds like it would be something that you'd have confidence in. So how would that fit into the yeah. second? Half? You have confidence in Torah. You don't have confidence that you're going to keep Torah. <laughs> So you're asking yeah, right. still Hashem for like Hashgacha and helping you with your eats or Hatsu. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.